Welcome to Island Baptist Church. Pastor Greg's lesson today is in Proverbs chapter 3, titled, Sound and Safe. I'm about to show a picture on the screen and uh, see if, uh, if any of you guys recognize it. Before we do, um, turn to Proverbs chapter 3 if you would. Turn to Proverbs chapter 3. We'll be in verses 20 through 26 today, and I trust you'll keep your Bible open so we can, when we refer to those, you'll be able to see the words and, and be spoken to by the Word of the Lord. Proverbs chapter 3. So a few years back, they were on the island where it was this particular building. Don't worry, I've not infringed on anybody's copyright with this. <clears throat> it's a, it's a low-quality image that a friend of mine had uh, t- taken a picture of it and has given me permission to use it, and so I doctor it and made it better. Better being not much better. But it, at any rate, anybody recognize the building? All right, some of you do. So if you go out here and you take a left, you go to Beach Access, County Beach Access number three, and you pull in just to the left, you'll see a giant concrete slab looking place where this building used to stand. And the construction of the Ocean Tower, which was its official name, one single tower, the Ocean Tower, began on April 5th in 2006, and it was going to be a 31 story building. And it would feature 147 uh, homes or residences with the, with the natural uh, perks of a gymnasium, swimming pool, a spa. It was going to be really upscale. Prices were going to be right around $2 million per unit. The 147 times $2 million, that's a lot of millions of dollars. And uh, the completed building was going to stand 445 feet tall. And as a matter of fact, I think that's, uh, it was to its actual maximum high height when this picture was taken, but there were problems with the ocean tower, as you might imagine, since it's not there. So two years into its, its construction, the lower core had sunk 14 to 16 inches, and I don't know that that's really that far off, or they may have actually planned for that, I don't know, but the problem was that while it had sunk 14 to 16 inches, the garage areas that were attached to it sunk at about half that rate. So they were about seven to eight inches difference, about yay much, between the actual tower and the garage unit, and they were together. And this caused some significant problems. And the pier pier supports, the giant, I don't know how big they were, it had to be huge for that kind of big of a building. They went 100 feet deep, and there were lots and lots of them to bear that weight. The problem was that these, these piers are designed to take vertical weight as best I understand, and I'm not an engineer, but I, I, I do think in terms of these things, they're designed to take weight this direction, but not at an angle. And so as the, the six or seven inch, eight inches off, began to put some horizontal stress on these, these, these giant piers that went 100 feet into the earth, and then because started having cracking and spalling and breaking, and eventually it caused the building to lean, and the tower became... It uh, became known as the Leaning Tower of Padre. And unlike the other Leaning Tower that you know of, it still stands with a lot of help. This one uh, was deemed to be unsafe, and uh, it could no longer remain standing. And so in December of 2009, this 50,000-ton building was imploded. And you can go online and you can find pictures, multiple little videos of, of the 8 or 10 seconds or whatever it was. It was a beautiful sight. How many of you guys were there to see the implosion? If you're local, you're going like, that's a big deal. Like this morning's rocket shot. You're part of history. And so people showed up. They, they videoed it. And this giant, beautiful structure crashed down. And where, where did the downfall take place? It didn't really take place on the day it was imploded. It took the take, take place. Maybe it had some wonky engineering. And if you're an engineer, you know that's a technical term. Wonky engineering where they didn't figure it out right. Or maybe the builders didn't build it right. And uh, there are still lawsuits, I think, out there trying to figure all that out. Somebody chased their money down and, and that kind of stuff. Maybe they've been settled. I don't know. But there were many lawsuits over that much money being wasted. But not only did it look crooked, it was unsound. It was unsafe. And today in Proverbs, we're going to look at those two ideas of soundness and safeness. So I want us to look 
first, in, inward here, and I'm going to ask you this question. How structurally sound is your life on the spiritual side? Proverbs chapter 3, verses 20. Uh, excuse me, verse 21. My son, preserve sound judgment and discernment, and do not let them out of your sight. They will be for you like an ornament of grace around your neck. And so how stands your life? How sound is your life? Structural soundness is built on something solid. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, He said, everyone who hears My words, the Word of God is the foundation. Everyone who hears My words and builds upon them is like building their house upon the rock. And if you own a place on the island, you did not follow Jesus' example. Because <clears throat> there is no rock. There is, this, is a, this is a sandbar. But what did they do in the ocean tower? They, they emulated rock by pouring all these beams. And your house can't be safe if it's engineered properly. But we need to build our lives not on some fake, some fake rock, but the real rock of Jesus so how stands the structural spirit part of your spiritual life, of your spiritual thinking, of your decision-making process? Are they built on this rock? Are you always going to the rock, to the Word for your answers? Are you caught up in what's the current thing? The culture? The culture of the day? Our reasoning... And decision-making process should be the kind of, of, we should build that in such a way that we can jump up and down on it. When I was about eight or nine years old, we built, <clears throat> we built a treehouse. I told this story before, but I'm going to tell it from a little different way. But we built a treehouse, and my mom had no idea it was 20-something feet in the air. She thought it was just like four or five. And we built it with our nine-year-old engineering brains, which were very far developed. <clears throat> and we also built it, with the items we could find in the ditch or in my dad's um, Maxwell House coffee can, your nail selection was based on what was in that can, and that's what you built with. And, we're tw and 15, 18, 20 feet up, we're building these st steps and stairs, and, and the 2 by 4 is, is this big, and our, na our nails that we're using, we would usually find one good nail that was good and long, and then we put like eight or ten other nails that just barely went into the tree. All right? And my mom comes out and sees that and goes, I, I don't even want to know. And she just went home. She said, boys will be boys and I hope they don't die. But we make, we make the decisions based on our maturity. And how mature are you in the Word? Because that's where, that's where the decision-making comes out of. And that decision-making should go back to those to those words, to those principles, and to those experiences that we view through the eyes of the Word. When I was a kid, I remember a, a commercial where a popular watch company took a watch and they strapped it to the front of a ski. Remember this? Some ringing a bell for anybody? A long time ago. And the, and the real the professional skier skis down the, the, the mountain and he pulls, pulls the watch off and they brush a little snow off it. And you know what they said? Some of you know. Timex takes a licking, keeps on ticking. And even as a kid, I, I knew that it would have been much more impressive if they put it underneath the ski instead of just on the tip. It was like, it's not getting quite the bruising that they think they're acting like it's getting. But it's strong enough to withstand something. And as believers, God wants us to be the strong tower, not the leaning tower. Not the skeptical tower where people are afraid to go. And He just wants us to be that strong tower. And our judgment should stand that test of time because it's built upon the bedrock of Jesus and who He is. Not on the shifting sands of worldly ideas not on the current the current in vogue idea about many factors we could go into some details we won't but i mean you look out in the world and they're crazy they're just gone crazy they're off they're off of science and they're off of reason 
And they're somewhere else that we just scratch our head and we can't understand. I know we had a lot, a lot of our young people from that generation, but they're not all that way. They, that, there are many of them that see through it, but for some reason it's way off. And you build your life on something that's a presupposition that's just you assume to be the rock you're going to be in trouble in the building of your life. So we've got to know God's Word and we also got to observe the mistakes we've made and we've got to filter those back through the Word and say, what can I learn? We need to listen. We need to hear. We need to be together with other like-minded people who look to the Scriptures for the answers. And when we make decisions, we need to make decisions that look at the outcomes. I played chess when I was, when I was younger and I was the 6th grade chess champion and I no longer have that trophy, but I was pretty proud of it for many years. I, there's only three people in my class that played chess, but nonetheless, I was a, I was a sixth grade champion, and, and I probably thought ahead like three moves ahead. It's like that's, that's as much as my little sixth grade brain could do. And, and wisdom in life, you've got to be thinking ahead, and when you do things, you can't just look one step ahead and say, that's a good idea, let's run with it, <clears throat> because you've got to think about who's going to be affected by it. And many times, we live in our own little circle, and we forget about the results that might ripple from our decisions that we make. Who gets hurt when I throw this up on Facebook? Who gets hurt when we make this decision? You can't make everybody happy. I'm not saying that. But I would at least consider ahead. And sometimes we need to speak words and sometimes we need to not speak. And it, maybe, maybe this, is, this was something for me uh, that, I, that I got this week through my study, but maybe it's for you too. That maybe there's a time... When you're out with people and somebody tells a good story about a subject and you have an equally or as good or better story about that same subject, maybe wisdom is letting that person have the moment in a story and celebrate their funny story, celebrate their moment, lift them up ahead of you. Ouch, that hurts me. So wisdom is not just in the big items that are going to make your house fall over. Wisdom in, are in the items that are going to make it awesome. I mean, for the first thing it's going to do is going to keep it safe. But secondly, it's going to make it awesome. I heard this quote from Emmanuel Kant. It said, science is organized knowledge, but wisdom is an organized life. And an organized, biblical, God-honoring life is going to be just always going back to the Scriptures. And not beating people up with them, but using it as your filter for your decision-making process. So that you can build up the body of Christ. You can build other people up. And you can uh, uh, use your wisdom to bless other people. Back to our passage. My son, preserve this sound judgment. Do not let them out of your sight. Sound judgment and deserve discernment. What do you think of when you say the word preserve? I think of chunky jelly. As a kid, like, no, I, I want the processed, a lot of sugar, nothing in it, no texture, jelly. And they preserve that jelly with a lot of chemicals. But the, the, the women of old, how, how, many of you, how many of you have ever preserved, done preserving stuff all right there's a trick there's a trick to it and there's work to it and there's love that goes into it and you preserve these things by uh by doing what it takes to make sure that they don't go rotten and they they're enjoyable now today I, you can have the store-bought sugary jelly i would go with the preserve for sure but we're supposed to preserve our sound judgment just like like the ancient people tried to preserve the things that were valuable they took their people and they did all their mum mummifying stuff to them. Chemicals and processes and places and coffins and multiple coffins. And they did everything they could to preserve what was valuable to them. And it's our job, it's your job, to preserve the wisdom and the knowledge that God brings up so that we don't let them out of our sight. Because they'll just run away on us. And it's our job to keep a close watch on these wise truths that we've learned. We're supposed to hawkeye them. We're supposed to be a shepherd to the wisdom that we've learned so that we don't let it out of our sight. And in doing so, we need to talk about them. That keeps them fresh. We need to be around people who talk about the wisdom of God's Word. 
And as iron sharpens iron, we will build one another up. You've seen the church where the church where it says life is your whatever your favorite thing is, right? Life is currently football for some, basketball for others coming soon, cheering, whatever your thing is, bowling. Life is beer. I, I, I still see a lot of them. I see some shirts that way, and I see some lives that way that say, life is beer. Life is houses, and then we move to bigger things. But pleasing God and honoring Him should be the life that we build on top of our wisdom. In Ephesians chapter 5, two verses, look them up when you get home. The Bible teaches us, live as children of light and find out what pleases the Lord. Wisdom is coming back to say, God, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to think about this particular thing? And then we preserve those ideas. And when we walk in God's ways, this, this passage in Proverbs says it will be like a beautiful necklace. All right, now I lost a bunch of you guys right there. Like, that's all good for women. No, I'm not into the beautiful necklace. But I, I want to I wanna repaint that as maybe more like, like a gold medal. Start hearing the music playing. Da, da. And then there you are, you're standing there with this necklace that says it means something. More than just beauty. And there's nothing wrong with the beauty part of it. But it means more than that. And around your neck is this, this, this emblem that is a reward from God. You have, you have basked in the wisdom and knowledge of God, and He rewards you with a necklace about you. And it's a sign of victory. And a real necklace is a sign of victory too. Uh, some of you ladies have shopped hard to find the victory in finding that perfect necklace that's beautiful. And it becomes like a trophy for God. He lays that upon you. He says, your wisdom is like wearing a beautiful necklace and it's a trophy that you can show off to other people. Anybody still here still have a childhood trophy or ribbon or button or pin? Anybody besides me? I do. All right, that's cool. Uh, you can't, can't keep them all, maybe. You know, if you're an NFL star, you might probably have a room full of them or something. But, you know, a kill keepsake box or something. You keep, like, this reminds me of something. I actually have a little hand grenade in my keepsake box. When I used to play with G.I. Joes, I found it in my backyard in the dirt, and there it is. And it's a, a little memento to the past, to a, a time gone by. And we wear the necklace of, of wisdom about us to remind ourselves and to remind others of how good God has been. And we, the reason we wear things is to adorn. Adorn, that's a fun word. It's not a word that's used very often. Adorn. If you go home and you say it four times in a row, you'll think it's not a real word. It's one of those odd words. But here's what it means. It means to make something more attractive by adding something to it, especially something beautiful. So God adorns us with this necklace, this proverbial and um, not physical necklace about us that, that does this, that. It makes us more beautiful. And it's a reminder of ourselves, of, of the victory that we've won with God's strength. It reminds us of the hard work that we've put in with His encouragement. It reminds us how blessed we are from God. And then the people outside, when we adorn ourselves with wisdom, they see the extra effort we put in to be kind and to be right. They see the results of our faithfulness, and they ultimately, through the power of the Spirit of God, they see God in our very lives. And so what's the, what's the big deal about, <clears throat> about a necklace? Well, here's a, here's a little art lesson from a guy who you would not want uh, giving you art lessons, but I'm going to give you one anyway. If you take a picture... And you hang it on your wall without a frame, it may be a wonderful picture. But the frame you put around that picture makes a difference. And depending on the colors, and I'm not good with colors, and depending on the, the hues, you can put a dark frame around it and it'll make the picture look completely different. You could put a light frame around it, you could put a natural, and it changes the look. You can wear glasses and it makes you look maybe a little smarter. That's why I wear these. Did you know these are just blue blockers? 
And they're, they're not to make me look better, but they, they do. You see some people, they just look better with glasses. I don't know if I'm that guy or not. But the way you frame something up makes a difference in how it looks. And God is framing your life up when you walk in wisdom to other people to say, wow, there's something different. And there's something special about that person because of the wisdom that you might not even know you exude, but you put it out there and you become spiritually beautiful and attractive. And that's what draws people to Christ through us. It's Christ in me. Did we not just sing that? Yet not I, but through Christ in me. And these necklace, this necklace around us, it, you know, perhaps you can th- you're thinking you can get too much of, uh, of this, this whole adornment. You can't, not in God's adornment. Maybe, maybe in real life, you know, what's currently popular will eventually be what you look back in the 70s. You're going to laugh at it. Whatever's currently popular, you will at some point turn back and laugh at it. Because nothing stays the same except God's ways and God's Word. So we wear our wisdom to benefit others. There's the beauty factor that they see, wow, there's something different and beautiful. And there's also the value factor when you wear a necklace. It's the materials that it's made of. It's made of experiences with God, learning from God. It's the time and intricacies. Some necklaces might be valuable because somebody handmade them. And in others, they're just valuable because who gave it to you? It might be some Fruit Loops on a string, but it's valuable. And when God gives you adornment, and, and, and it's what He says this wisdom is, when you gather that wisdom and you walk in it with wisdom, He gives you a milestone. He gives you a trophy. And you can choose the milestone... Or you can choose the millstone. You can walk in your wisdom. I'm sorry, this is God's wisdom. I, and your wisdom's over here. God's wisdom's right. You can walk in God's wisdom. Or you can walk in any other kind of wisdom. And it's better off for you to have, to, to, to have a millstone tied around your neck, Jesus says, than to lead someone astray and use ungodly wisdom. So lack of wisdom is really anti-wisdom. Because you're saying to God, no thank you. You got a good way, but I got a better way. We don't mean to say that, but that's what our lives say. And Jesus, kind of most everything he does, he lays it out in a this or that. Jesus said himself, he who's not with me is against me. And he who's not with, uh, does not gather with me, he is the one who scatters things Away. So we've got to preserve this wisdom and wear it about our neck and wear it about our lives so that our tower is strong and our, st- our tower is straight. Hold on to wisdom and good sense. That's what the New Century Version says. Good sense, logical thinking in the Word of God. And it will be a, like a beautiful necklace around you. And it's an ornament of grace. It's a sign of God's presence. When Moses was in God's presence... He physically glowed. He was the only one that really had face-to-face with God, and he physically glowed. And then the disciples of Christ, who were just ordinary men, went out and talked to people, and, and the crowds said about them, they said, who are these men? Aren't they just untrained, uneducated people? And they said, yes. But they've been with Jesus. And the glow... The Moses glow and the disciple glow comes from being with Jesus and basking in His great wisdom. And what does that wisdom produce for us? Then you will go on your way in safety. Oh, there's, there's a nice little benefit. And your foot will not stumble, stumble, and when you lie down, you will not be afraid. And when you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. So with God's wisdom comes His protection. And some of that's natural because you're making better choices, but I believe a lot of that is miraculous God intervention. And if you're where God wants you to be, you are the safest you will ever be. It doesn't matter if it's in a, if it's in a foxhole, it's on a mission trip, someplace that has diseases. If God calls you there, that's the safest place you can be. Now safety, the way we look at it, might be a little different. But God's safety says you're as safe as, I, as I've called you to be, and I will protect you from everything that will keep you from uh, fulfilling your purpose. So are you safe? Yeah, do you feel safe? Hmm, not always. 
not always, but we can be safe in the knowledge that God says He has got us taken care of. So this soundness, this stability in our life, it, it comes from God's wisdom, and it's our best chance to not be stumbling around in our lives. At least stumbling to the point where we, we disqualify ourselves. Paul said in 2 Corinthians, he said, I beat my body and I make it my slave so that after I've preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. We don't want to be the tower that started strong and started leaning and just people watch and people get their popcorn and hang out and watch us just fall apart. But walking in God's wisdom doesn't mean we play it safe. God's going to take us into challenging places as individuals, as a church. We'll be over, overcoming odds and we'll be winning victories and we'll, we, we will do th- great things for the Lord. So he says, and the fear, the fear of those battles will subside when we walk in wisdom. And our sleep will be sweet. I have the gift of sleep. And I used to joke about that, but then I I know a lot of people who cannot sleep and more than a couple hours at night. And I've had just a very few of those nights, and I understand that it is indeed a gift to sleep. And God says when we walk in wisdom, our sleep will be sweet. It doesn't mean it'll be perfect, but it'll be sweet. But we also have to walk in wisdom of of science, too, because you can't can't drink nine liters of, of Mountain Dew a day and expect to have good sleep. You can't... You can't eat hot, spicy Mexican food at night at 11 when you go to bed and expect to really have a good night's sleep, most of you. Now, some of you can. I know. You, that's, that, you roll that way. And you can't be on your screen like all day long. and all, every, there's, some, there's some science. But God says if we, and, uh, and there's some wisdom in following science. But if we come back to God's Word and we're resting in Him, we can find sweet sleep. And also you can't talk about negative things all day and think about negative things all day and feel sorry for yourself all day and then think that you're just going to when you turn off the physical light switch you're going to click another light switch and your brain's going to quit because you've trained it all day long to go that route and so we need to learn to be still and know that he's God we need to have quiet times and we need to prepare ourselves as we add things like forgiveness to our lives as we add controlling our thoughts and we push out worry and fear, then we can find the sweet sleep that God promises us, the sweet rest in Him. So as you walk in wisdom and victory, we'll also avoid catastrophic events, catastrophes. There are two different kinds of, of, of catastrophic events. You can think of one, uh, but... We'll talk about what the Bible says here first, but then we'll talk about the other. Have no fear of sudden disaster or the ruin that overtakes the wicked. Now note, note the difference there. It's not, just, it's not like the hurricanes and tornadoes. that He's saying that these things overtake the wicked, meaning that they have some part in it. They, they are a part of a judgment from God. For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being snared. We all, we all have a death appointment. The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die, and it's going to happen. And uh, <clears throat> you may not have the same theology as I do, but you know, if I'm supposed to take a bullet for you, I will. I'll, and then when that time comes, I'll jump in front, and, and that'll be how it goes. And if you're supposed to take one for me, then, then you'll do that. Um, however it's supposed to happen, I believe that it's going to happen. Uh, everybody doesn't believe that. But when we, when we put our trust in God's Word, He says that we have an appointment, then all of a sudden, it ceases to be fearful. Stonewall Jackson was a, was a Confederate general, and he was regarded as a great military mind, although he was definitely on the wrong side of slavery. There's no doubt about that. He had a good theology when it came to his death. He said, my religious belief teaches me to feel as safe in battle as I feel in bed. God's got it. God has fixed the time for my death, and I do not concern myself about that, but to always be ready no matter what or when it may overtake me. In this way, all men should live, and then all men would be equally brave. Without fear, we're going to do great things for the Lord, but if we're, we're, we're fearful, not only of death, 
it trickles down into, into a fear of what other people are going to say about you. I'm going to stand strong for Jesus at school. And then the time comes and fear can crop up. Am I right? It does. I don't care how spiritual you are here, here. You get out in the real world. It gets hard. So how is your spiritual bravery going to move you forward? How is it going to move you that direction? We just have to be ready for whatever comes and then turn it over to God. And believe what He says. His hand of protection will be there. As far as the wicked come, there's, there's some natural des- destruction that's going to come their ways. And maybe God does use a tornado or a, or a uh, or hurricane to judge one, a particular individual. But I don't believe He sends the whole thing to get one person. But, but God's the God of, of everything. And, and in every situation, God can bless you through the miss of a, of a hurricane. We have, we have on the island, we have a lot of near misses with hurricanes. And God has blessed us, but as soon as He... Uh, you know, he, somebody else gets it. I don't know how that works. But He can bless you in the miss. He can bless you in the rebuild. He can certainly bless you in, in the death, in your death. It was one of our members who told me just recently, said that uh, she wasn't too excited, you know, that her, about her mother passing away, but that three people at the funeral came to Christ through it. It's hard to argue with that kind of success. I mean, you wouldn't wish one for the other, but God in His mysterious ways. But what He does promise is that you're not going to succumb to those natural, those natural consequences, those natural horrible things that, that may come. And then here we look about God guarding and God guiding. In verse 23, both of these, these passages, we've already looked at verse 23, are about, about your foot. Then you will go on your way in safety and your foot will not stumble. And then jump into verse 26. The Lord will be your confidence and He will keep your foot from being snared. So when you walk along the path in wisdom, what's going to happen? God's going to guard your foot. Are you going to stumble some? Yeah, everybody stumbles some. But not the stumble that takes you off the path. Not the stumble that ruins your life. You're going to stumble, but He's going to keep you from stumbling and being uh, the crooked tower. And in verse 26, He keeps the evil one from snaring your foot. Ah, both of those are equal blessings. But the last one, there's always a spiritual warfare going on around us. There's stuff happening all around us. We don't see, and we don't have to be concerned about it. And I know sometimes people get caught up in this the spiritual warfare and you want to figure out what that's about. Spiritual warfare out there is God's part. You do your part. He takes care of all that. But God, through wisdom, He spins off these sneak attacks as Satan would try to get you. There's no temptation that's come to you, but it's common to man, and God provides that way of escape. And you might not realize it, but God blocks the devil's plans all the time. All the time. And you don't have to be aware of it, and I'm, I'm getting a little, little emotional here just thinking about it, because he does that work. I just get to be the blessed of it. But if you walk in his wisdom, he promises to keep your foot from the snare that would drag you off. He brings us back to that foundation, the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord will be your confidence. Oh, we can live in fear if we want. But if you're a wise person, you're going to constantly be coming back and the Lord will be your confidence. Friends and fellow believers, the Lord is our confidence. He is your rock if you're a believer. There's none like Him. Do you know? Do you know this Jesus? The one who died on the cross to take away the sins of the world? The Jesus who brought Himself back to life through the power of God that He was? Lived on earth 40 days or so and then went back to heaven to come back again. Do you know this Jesus? The old hymn, it says, On Christ the solid rock I stand. On who He is, we stand on that. We build our life. It's a testimony to those around us. His design for your life has no wonkiness. Perfectly designed. And if you will build it on His his rock via His Word, 
It will be a sound structure that will give light and He will keep you safe. Sound and safe. God's design for every believer's life. Pray with me if you would. God, we thank You that You speak to us through the power of Your Word. You've made these precious promises. And God, we can trust You in those. I pray today for every every heart that's heard Your Word, Lord, and You speak to all of us in different ways. And I don't pretend to know how You've spoken to them. You've challenged me to, to be more like Your Son, to have more confidence in You, to be bolder. And I pray that Whatever you're saying to each heart, that we will each say yes to that today. God, I thank you for your presence, and I pray that you'll move during this last song as we, as we acknowledge you, as we lay our lives before you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.